Yeah, okay. So some of you saw the film that I shot last. Yeah, you're like, I know you were there. You're like, I sat through it, can't remember anything about it. It was last night. Um, so, so that's helpful. Some of you have seen it and some of you haven't. Um, I, um, I've been doing this work for, I would say, 30 years, um, which is amazing to me. Um, and obviously, as we all know, landscapes are shifting all of the time. And that's part of um, the lives of people attempting to create moving images. Um, but I would say that the sort of fundamental things that aren't changing is, is like, with what do you do the work, right? And so I would say it's like, it's a work of the body. Um, so you're all sitting here and I will eventually, I will be moving, I will making the camera people really work because, you know, life is not staying in the right place. It's, uh, it's moving around and I'm, you know, we will have time today for you to get up and move because I really think of this work as physical labor uh, in the sort of the best sense of the word, uh, that you are um, doing literally sort of grounded work. Like you are, your, your feet are connected to the earth, you touch other people, um, you are in movement, uh, you experience things in a sensorial way. So when you film, you smell the food of, that the people in front of you are eating, even if you can't eat it because you're filming them. Uh, you can uh, sort of feel the emotional pressure that people are living with. Um, and, you know, if it's freezing outside, you keep your hat on, right? <laughs> uh, so all of those things are happening as a, as a person who's making the work. You, you're a physical person in the space, but then what you're doing gets translated to this, right? And, and what this is, like what the screen is or what the frame is, continues to change throughout the history of photography and filming. Even the dimensions of the frame are changing, right? So when I first started filming, you were looking at a relatively square format of the image. And now the image is a rectangle. And so even the, the sort of boundaries of how we translate the experience of being, you know, this person with the camera in the space to some format, that's always changing. But I would say what isn't changing, like the way like the body in space is not going anywhere, even if we're filming augmented reality or virtual reality or whatever we're filming, we still, the people who, um, go into the world and are filming with people, we have to be there. So I think there's some really, like, that's this interesting, you know, sort of, I think we're all living in this moment where it's becoming very, uh, you know, what's the brave new world? There's sort of a dystopian, I was just looking at the New York Times website and they have this new augmented reality feature for looking at news where you can see objects come into your own space. I don't know if anyone's seen that yet. Um, so I think, all humans are wondering like, okay, what comes next in terms of how images are presented to us? But we are the people who are interested in how do, how do things get constructed and how do they go from my experience to a, this experience? Um, the other thing that is not changing, I think, is a little bit what I talked about last night of um, this work is time travel, right? So here we are, this is the present, but each of us in the room is coming from somewhere. Some of us didn't have enough breakfast. I actually did have enough breakfast. So I feel great. But some of you are distracted, right? You're like, ah, how did I, why was I late so I didn't get to go eat food, right? So you're like, can I make it till one o'clock or whatever? What time are we having our break? At one? Yeah, exactly. So, so, yeah. So, so this is like, because we're all together here and we're all human bodies, these are the thing, like some of my very first things that I will impart to you, the greatest gift I will give to you uh, is uh, your relationship to hydration. <laughs> you actually really, as a camera person, 
you are only able to function if you are hydrated. But because the world, things are happening, and you don't know when they're going to stop or start, the very critical thing is you must never go to the bathroom. So how do you do this, <laughs> this great work? <laughs> so it's a, it's, a really, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing of like, now I, I'm in a place where I can, uh, I know exactly in an intuitive way the amount of water to drink to not go to the bathroom for like 12 hours if I have to, like the shooting just continues. So, so this, this is like the best, this is the most important thing if you are a camera person or a director that you can learn, is like how to stay really hydrated and uh, also be able to not have to leave the action, right? So this is, you will think of that today and at some point one of you will be like, I gotta go to the bathroom now. It's okay, you can leave this space, go to the bathroom, come back. I will not judge you. <laughs> you have not yet learned the technique, but you will see me today, you'll be like, when does she go to the bathroom? You go to the bathroom at any opportunity that you have where the action breaks. So this thing of like really being aware of like you're a body doing the work. The other thing is whether you're working with crew or you are taking care of yourself, you have to feed yourself. And this is a crazy thing too that happens a lot with directors. It's people get really into it and really anxious and really excited and they stop needing to eat. Has anyone ever experienced this? Right? Right? Turns out, if you're a crew member, you still need to eat. <laughs> but directors often forget this. Even if you are the director and the camera, you forget this. Um, and I remember very clearly one day, we'd been like working for hours, and, and the director was a woman, and she said, oh, oh, I'm so glad. I'm on a diet. We don't have time to eat. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm not on a diet with you. <laughs> So, so this is this other thing that, that like, once again, like, return to the body. So in this, we, we'll have a coffee break. We'll have a lunch break. We'll be humans who are, we won't only sit. I will make you all stand up. In fact, why don't I make you all stand up now? Because it's just like, you know, you're all, like, settling in. You know it's bad for your core. So, so here's the thing I, I want you all to think about. Uh, all right, so, so when you get freaked out, how many people hold stress like in their stomach? Yeah. How many people hold stress like in their shoulders? Yeah. Uh, how many people are like me and you do this weird thing where you grip your toes to the earth? Anybody? When you're shooting, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, oh, start holding onto the. Um, anybody else have a place where they hold their stress? Right here. In your oh oh oh. Oh, perhaps me too. I don't know. There's like a little line there. All right. So, so, so how many of you, you're standing right, you're like standing, like, my troops, like, where can I take you? Let's go. Um, how many people have their knees locked right now? How many people, your knees are locked? Nice. Good noticing. How many people, uh, okay, so it's like stand, feel your feet relaxed on the ground, put your feet sort of, you know, hip width apart. Okay, your toes are relaxed. How many of you, especially women, are thinking like you're uncomfortable with standing this way? You are, put your book down. How many, so there's like a thing like women learn how to do of like how to stand to look attractive. In fact, when you're a camera person, nobody cares what you look like and you should care the least, right? So like get your feet wider apart. So this is basically called man spreading. We're gonna do it right now, <laughs> right? Because what you need to be able to do when you're filming is you need to be able to move in any direction, right? So how many people have uh, done yoga here? How many people have played basketball here? How many people don't consider themselves athletic in any way? How many people have lifted weights here? Oh, yeah, nice. Uh, so, so here's the thing. How many people have done Tai Chi? Yeah, all right. So I, I'm, you guys see, I'm much too fast twitch for Tai Chi. There's no way I can do it. But in many ways, it, there's like a tai, if you have Tai Chi flow, you're in really good shape. So, the, so here's the idea is like, so first, just sort of rock back and forth. Uh, your feet are planted on the ground. Your knees are bent. Your knees are locked. Okay, your knees are locked. 
Right, so, so, so it's not like, it's not like, you're not trying to be here, because then go down, feel the pressure on your quadriceps, right? Nobody is holding this position for a long time, right? You can't, because you've got, your muscles are engaged. Now fold your hands. Give yourself, you need balance, right? So your hands need to be free to move. Oh yeah, look at, oh, Tai Chi Master is here. <laughs> We're gonna learn Tai Chi this morning, actually. Oh, come up here with me. This is a, yeah, come. <laughs> So, so, all right, so what's the first, what's the first position of Tai Chi? I, I actually only practice the, the Tai Chi called Tai Chi Swan. Uh, Whoa. <laughs> the oh, the sword. Wow. Yeah, so, so it's, it's more like this. Right. <laughs> so see what, <laughs> yeah, but you still got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what he's got is flow. Yeah, it's a flow. Right? Did you see that? Can you do that again? Do the, do the sword. Just do the sword. Just do the sword. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. All right. See, ooh, see, this is good. This. So, so basically, what you're looking for is flow. I give you freedom. You can, you can come back anytime. So, so what you're looking for is you don't want a camera to be doing this, and you also don't want a camera to be breathing. You've got to breathe. The camera can't breathe. And so I'm talking about, you know, being handheld right now, right? But you don't know at what speed the action's going to happen. And sadly, it doesn't happen at Tai Chi speed. Often it happens at really fast speed, right? And you've got to be able to move, turn backwards, anticipate. Um, I, you all, I, like, I really want to do something with you. I don't know what. Uh, let's, let's all take over. Um, but so, so if you bend your knees, and you move from side to side. Now, we all have different sized bodies, turns out, right? Some of us are women, some of us are men, some of us see no gender definition, right? But we all have bodies. And your body is gonna have a relationship to the camera that you're holding. So if you have to film a person who's this tall and you're this tall, you're gonna have to hold a camera here. If you have to film a person who's this tall, and you're this tall, you gotta go down here. If you're this tall, and you gotta film him, what do you do? Right? <laughs> okay, that was good, that was good, that was good. Did everyone see her body? Do your thing again. How, how about this? Is this gonna work out? <laughs> right? How long is she gonna be able to hold that as a position? Not, right? So, so, you have to be able to find the way that within your body you have a calm that you can sustain. So anytime you get in a position of strain, so how many people do this when they're holding a camera? They grip, right? You're holding on to it. It's like you got to let your hands be free and Here's your chest, here are your lungs. And so if you're holding a camera like this, what's your camera doing? <sighs> right? But if you're holding like this, go, everyone go like this. All right, everyone strain forward like this. Feel your back muscles. Okay, everyone put your shoulder blades back and settle them down. Everyone put your shoulders up like this to your ears. How long can you hold that camera? You got it, right? You got it, it's shaking. So it's like, bring your shoulders down. If you can, depending on what your body is, take your elbows, like your little chicken wings, and sort of bring them down to the side of your body and breathe up and down. Okay, your camera's moving, right? So can you Rest your arms against your torso and breathe, but not move your hands. Can everyone feel that? So your arms are out, right? You've got your arms out. And, and some people, there are some women whose breasts are too big. They can't, like, or they can They'll go like this, right? Like, depending on who you are with your body, you can hold your arms. But the idea is, like, how can you sort of support your elbows? and not feel the breathing. Anybody's arms getting tired? No? You're the most silent set of people I've ever found. 
Are your arms getting tired? No. Because you're, right, it's kind of, because you're basically resting your arms on your body. Your shoulders are relaxed, your hands are relaxed. Your knees, whose knees are locked? Mine were, right? It's a real default, because your body's trying to figure out how to be straight and how to be level. So what a lot of us do is just rock back and lock our knees. But in fact, just keep like stretching out those toes, bend your knees a little bit. Okay, so then, and then what are we doing with our, what are we doing with this, right? Where are our necks? This is so hard with the cameras that exist now, right? Because you're looking, your eyes are looking down at screens. This whole connection of your neck, trying to keep it relaxed is a real challenge. And I do this, right? One, because it's really, I'm not saying it's a good thing to do. But it's what I do because one, makes for a very nice neckline and you have no little chin curls. So, so, so but that's the thing like, right, where you're being self-conscious about how do I look in the world as opposed to what does my body need to be able to function. So everyone go like this. Where do you feel it? It's like right back in here, right? Oh, you're good at it. You do this. You also do this, right? Some people know. Some people are like, yeah, I got this. I do this all the time. So, so, so the trying to sort of feel right back at the base of the head. You can, you know, feel those two wonderful little knots of muscle that are right there at the back of the head, and you realize, like, oh, okay, that area can stretch out. My chin can come down and my head can sort of get more realigned with my spine. So all of these things, like, this is real, because you have to do this for sometimes 10 hours at a time with a camera, right? So how many people could stand all day? Interesting, right? In general, this work often means you have to stand all day. And, and one of the reasons like, why you wouldn't want to stand for this entire master class is because you know, the blood's all draining and going down in one spot. And so this sort of idea that you're like constantly moving doesn't work with a camera, right? You don't want to be doing this while you're shooting. But one of the really powerful things, so right now I can see you, 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 but I can't see you, right? So everyone do like a tiny move to the side or to the other side and see who you can see or not see. Just the tiniest little gesture, right? Everybody see that? Right? Don't even move your feet. Just, just like, ah, uh, where are you? I got you, right? So like looking for eye lines. I see you in the back, right? So I'm going to come over here now. <clears throat> Everybody pivot on your axis. Turn. Turn, yeah. Everybody understanding me? Yes, OK. So now, here we have these lines of people. Everyone's going to have to like shift slightly to be able to see me, right? And you shift. So this is often the thing of reframing or finding the difference between an extraordinary composition and a very banal composition is often that much of a move, right? It's not, right? It's often just that. So everybody in this line, Stay still. Uh, woman behind the guy in the hat. What's your name? Joe. Joe? OK, so Joe, so Joe, look, everybody turn and face Joe. <laughs> OK, so Joe, give me a composition of this line of people from your position right now. Yeah. So see, see if you can see everyone in this line. OK, look at, oh, look what Joe just did. She just tipped over, right? So Joe was on her two feet. I'm going to have to stand on a chair so everyone can see. All right, so Joe was on her two feet, and she leaned like this, right? Yeah. yeah. Two feet on the ground, especially when you're on a chair. So look at Joe's feet. Joe, what, is that, are those your hips? No, Joe was doing girl standing. Joe was like this, and then she went, whoop, and lost her shot. OK, so that, the men don't spread that far. You can do like right here, OK? Your knees are still a little locked, right? 
OK, so frame up all these people in this line. How are you going to do it? Can you do it? So in a way, she can't do it without stepping, right? So you're, you're here. Oh, right there. It's all in the hips. I'm not going to touch anybody. But look, so, so it's like here I am. If I go to here, I've got all of the faces. You see all the fa Do you see all of your faces? Right? So, so Joe just did that without, she did that. That was like a sweet, that was a sweet cinema move, right? It wasn't, that wasn't a sweet cinema move. That isn't a sweet cinema move. But that is called a reveal, right? This is the most beautiful thing about cinema. You have setup and you have reveal. So, which is, films, so, so, so there's like this idea of like, why do we keep watching movies? It's because they are pulling us forward. We are interested in them, right? Sometimes it's because of their narrative trajectory, right? We know exactly what's happening and we want to know what's going to happen next. Sometimes a film moves forward with no narrative, but it is pulling you forward into it. And part of how that happens is you start with this on a close-up, and then, boom, you reveal that there are four people behind him, right? So it's a beginning, maybe an end. We don't know. Maybe that's a middle, right? And maybe this is the end. So when you're doing camera work, you don't know where the beginning is, you don't know where the middle is, and you don't know where the end is, right? This is like the relationship to time. So it happens to be the first moment that you picked up your camera and turned it on could be here, where you've got the composition perfect, and then you turn it on, right? This is what I used to do when I first started doing camera work, is I so wanted to be good, and I was so embarrassed of making mistakes that I would get the perfect composition and then I would hit record. Does anybody do this? Yeah. And then the perfect composition ends and then you hit off. Right? And then you go and you find another perfect composition and uh, uh. I had this wonderful editor who very, uh, very young in my work said, what is this? You're giving me nothing to work with. I was like, what are, you, what, are you, what are you talking about? I'm trying so hard. I'm like giving you these perfect compositions. And then I was like, you're giving me nothing to work with. You don't know where anything begins or ends, right? So if you're thinking about shooting him, you could turn on the camera here and come up, find the shot, the most beautiful shot of you. What's your name? And Matthew, perfect shot of you. And then, ooh, reveal, we have, what's your name? Pedro. Pedro. What is it? Mondexum. Mondexum? Anna. Anna? Anna. Joyce. Joyce. Boom. What a reveal. You thought you had only him. You have them. You have? Tess. Tess? Henry. Henry? Adrian. Uh-huh. Camera person? Yes, what is your name, camera person? You are here in the room, too? Andra. Andra? Yeah. Ayaka. Uh-huh. Her mom. Uh-huh. Wow. Boom. That's a party in here, right? Like, and once you have this idea, you realize, OK, ah, uh, oh, shoot, there's a camera over there. I didn't, that wrecks my perfect shot. Let me film around it. Let me pretend it isn't there. Let me pretend she isn't there. And this is, I think, one of the great mistakes that we make as camera people. And we make uh, whether, you know, she did the same thing. She, she pulled herself out. She said, I'm not here, right? You're like, ah, don't see me. She's right here. She's right in the middle of my shot. Now, this is where we talk about what's truth or not truth, right? Because what you can do, you can frame around her. You can go like this, and go down, and go here. And we'll never see her. 
She was here all along. So it is not this relationship to truth, reality, what you are filming, was quite a complicated business. You didn't line everyone up here and put them in place. I did that. You all came and sat down in these positions. You did that. You now have the choice of how do you frame this reality, right? And it, 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 it comes from what matters to you. So you may want to say, hey, this thing is being recorded. So I'm going to start here on the camera, go through here, go to her. And that's the subject of what you're filming. Or you may say, no, there's no cameras in the room. Right? Or you could do both things from the same position. And you're telling two radically different stories about what's happening in this space. Now, that might be like meaningless in this moment. So what's the big deal? We're filming. I'm going to do a shot where, uh. in the future, it may really matter to a film you didn't know you were making because some crazy fight breaks out between the two of you here. And we learn a crazy story about the two of you. And it turns out she knew that when the two of you got in a room, it was going to be crazy. And she ran over here and filmed it. And you want to use her footage, plus the footage of them fighting. And what you need is the beginning of her story, where she was over there filming politely. But you don't know that while you're filming. So one of the things that you're always thinking about is sort of, how do I create the option to tell many stories? Because you actually don't know what the story is. None of you know how long I'm going to make you keep standing. Right? In fact, I'm not making you keep standing. Any one of you could sit down at any time. Would anyone like to sit down? <laughs> Boom. One down. <laughs> Anybody else want to sit down, right? Everybody is allowed to sit down. Sit down. Everyone sit down. You weren't even making me nervous. <laughs> Did any of you feel nervous while standing? Or self-conscious? Ah, you were good. You guys, ah, you felt a little self-conscious. Yeah. This is like this amazing thing that happens that I've learned over time. A lot of your capacity to film is connected to your own emotional capacity. So you may get very nervous or uncomfortable with the not knowing what's going to happen in a situation, right? So you thought I was going to stand up there. But in fact, I'm here. You didn't expect me to sit here. Hi. Hi. What's your name? I'm Don. Don? Hi, nice to meet you. What's your name? Roy. Roy, hi. What's your name? Pamela. Pamela, hi. Fati. Fati? Yeah. Yuki. Yuki. So none of them expected me to come back here and start talking to them, right? Didn't see it coming. Now. I could just keep talking to them for the rest of the morning. What would you all need to do? If I just decided, like, I'm going to focus here, would you stay seated where you're seated? One, you might walk out, <laughs> right? But two, you need to shift in your position. Some people cannot see me right now. Everybody moves so they can actually see my face, right? For many of you, that was a slight move. You didn't need to do much. But you did need to move, right? And so one of the things we've been trained to do is be, be good people, be good students, sit facing forward, not stand up, not move, right? So I moved again. There are several of you who still can't see me, right? Where did I go? There I am. There I am. There I am. There I am, right? So this thing of sort of eye contact, how you get it, how you keep it, it often involves moving. So I can't shoot the row of people from here. I can see you all here, right? You all saw that. Three of you can't see me now, right? You can only see me. This act of sort of constantly questioning and thinking about where am I positioned? 
in a physical way, right? You're making an emotional and intellectual choice by sitting down here. I'm getting closer to these people, right? I'm, I'm different than I was up there. How am I different? What, what can you see about me that you couldn't see before? I have more wrinkles like than you. Yeah, yeah. In much more details. Much more details. What can you see about me that you couldn't see before? I'm much more animated. I'm much more animated. What can you see about me that you couldn't see before? Um, your outfit. I couldn't see your trousers. Can everyone hear? So she's saying she couldn't see my she couldn't see my trousers before. You, he couldn't see how animated I was. You saw. You're seeing more detail. What are you seeing? I can hear you much clearly. You can hear me much more clearly. Okay. My gest how much I use my hands, right? Okay, so now, if I like come down through here, right? Now what changes? <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, right? Now she can see in my eyes. Okay, so you've all been listening to me talk for, what's it been, 20 minutes? Okay, watch. I'm totally different than I was, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, see, you're totally different. I'm totally different. Come here. Right? Right? You thought you were uncomfortable before. You're more uncomfortable now, right? Right? Overwhelming. Whoa. Right? I'm in her face. Right? And I've learned something about her. You were one of the few people who admitted to being uncomfortable standing up. I would bet you are also slightly uncomfortable now, right? Yeah. yeah, because I'm bringing her to the center of attention. Everyone is now looking at her. She thought she could come to this workshop and nobody would see her. She would just be listening to me talking up there. So this is a power dynamic, right? I have the power in this room. I'm the expert. I'm the master. You all came to see me. So I, you would rather I go away, right? You would rather I go over there. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I'm staying here. You'll survive. It's going to be OK, right? But, and, and this, is, I, this is in some ways an aggressive act, right? I've identified you who are uncomfortable being seen. And I'm staying here. And I'm seeing you, and you're seeing me. And we're surviving. It's not the best for you. It's not that bad. I'm not that comfortable either, right? I'm not that physically comfortable. This staying in uncomfortable places is something that you must learn to think about and have a relationship to. And understand that what's easy for you, for me, may not be easy for the person who you are asking something of, right? So I'm asking something of you, which is to stay in the center of attention. I have learned that's not easy for you, and I'm telling the whole world, right? In some ways, this is an abuse of power, right? You, you didn't ask for this. This is often what we do to people when we film them or ask them questions. We ask them, tell me your most vulnerable thing. And I'm filming this for, it will exist in the future for all reality. And they thought they wanted to do it. But once you get here, you're like, I thought I wanted to come to a master class. I just want to go home. I just want to have a cup of coffee, right? People's minds change when they experience the reality of a thing. So. I'm staying with this and thank you. You're being very generous, right? So she is, she is gifting something on behalf of all of us. She didn't want to, didn't start out that way. I'm not letting her escape. And you are being gracious, right? Now, if we are, if this is a situation where we're filming, it may be that she's being gracious because she has to. Because you're her community of peers, and if she says, please stop, she thinks, oh, that makes me look bad. 
I can't do that. So you are letting me stay, but you don't want to. You're doing it against your will, and you're putting a good face on it, right? This is also what happens when people are being filmed. They're trapped, right? And you're the one trapping them. <laughs> and not only that, you've got a camera and you're recording it. Do you feel a little bit better that you think I'm going to leave? <laughs> right? You're like, you're like, whew, have no idea what she's going to do next, right? And I think this is often the state that a person who is being filmed is in. They don't know if they can trust you. They don't know where you're going next. They don't know what you're going to do with the footage. They don't know what the, the piece or the movie or whatever it's going to be is going to be. So this is where I talk about an image as a relationship, right? It's a relationship in this moment between us. That helped that I smiled, right? So this is a thing often that camera people do of like, I'm invisible. I'm not here. I can't talk. I can't say. I can't remember your name. What's your name? Um, I'm Dexon. I'm Dexon. Uh, Dexon. 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 Do you speak quietly or loudly in life? I think it really depends. Yeah. yeah. It depends. Um, were you born in Hong Kong? Yeah. Yeah. And what is your favorite? What's a, what's a movie you love? Um, playtime. Playtime. Oh my god, I love playtime. <laughs> Boom. We discovered something in common. But you had a difficult moment there. Her eyes went here, here, here. Because I said, what's your favorite movie? And by saying what is her favorite movie, she reveals something to you, and all of you might judge her, right? If you're like, really? Jacques Tati? Are you kidding me? Right? So she, I'm doing something easy for me. Oh, I, I want to learn about you. Tell me this thing. She is revealing something that puts her in a vulnerable position. You came up with a great answer on the spot, right? It may or may not be true that Playtime is her favorite movie. It's true, yes. <laughs> but it may or may not be true, right? Because it may be that there's someone in the room who is going to give her a grade. And she knows that person's favorite movie is Monsieur Hulot, the Les Vacances de Monsieur Hulot. So she's like, I say playtime, boom, this person approves of me. Or it may be that she's in love with someone in the room who she's never been able to speak to, and she believes that they will love Tati like she does, and if she says it, suddenly they will see her. So she's using the relationship to communicate about something else that matters to her. Or it may be that she really wants me, she really wants to please me. And you totally, you succeeded. Did you know you were going to make me happy when you said that? No. no. Right? She didn't know that I love playtime too. So now suddenly we have common territory. We just became a Venn diagram. We overlap about Jacques Tati. We know nothing else about each other, but now I know that you have a sense of humor. Didn't know that before, right? Because even though I smiled and she smiled back at me, that could have just been being polite. So here's the thing. We don't know what's going on inside other people. I didn't know that you were born in Hong Kong. I didn't know that you loved Jacques Tati. I don't know if you were telling me the truth or not. Now I believe you, right? <laughs> I didn't know all those things. I had to speak to her to find out those things. But I did know that you were uncomfortable with having me get close. And I did know there was a moment of 
shall I say, panic when I asked you what your favorite movie was? What was it? Oh. It, was, it was like you were like, how can you come up with, or was it your thinking? Was it just you thinking? Yeah, which one? Yeah, yeah. So I read, <gasps> as panic, in fact, she was thinking. So you are projecting things onto other people when you film them. So what was true, what happened in front of the camera was her eyes went whoop, whoop, whoop. Someone in the audience who sees that shot will say, oh, wow, what an active thinker she is. Someone else will say, wow, she really panicked in that moment. We don't know. Neither you or I know what is true. Right? You may wish to think you were thinking, but part of you was scared. And you think that you hid that successfully. But in fact, the camera saw something in your eyes. And when you see the movie of yourself, you'll be like, wow, I was really freaked out. And it is only in seeing yourself through the camera that you will have new information. And you realize, huh, that's funny. I wonder why I did that. And then you'll go on a search. Ah, oh, that felt good. Everyone relaxed, right? So, so this is where I say there's a past, present uh, uh, relationship. It used to be when I came into this room, I didn't know her name. I didn't know she loved Jacques Tati. I didn't know she had a sense of humor. I didn't know that she was initially in uncomfortable being in the, but now she's getting, now she's like, ah, I'm the center of attention, story of my life, right? She's getting more comfortable, somewhat. Yeah, you're like, get out of here. Yeah, you're like, you can move along, right? And how do I know that? Right? You're like, oh, how do you? She's doing something with her hands. Once again, I don't really know what it means. But the way I'm reading it is like, whew, OK, let me breathe. Go talk to somebody else. But now she's looking at me across the room like, come back. Stay over here with me. That was interesting. We were engaged in something. So this is the other thing we do to people when we film. We create this super intense relationship. It's just you and me. We're the only ones who hear, like, let's talk about Jacques Tati. And then all of a sudden, oh, I see something interesting over here. And I leave her. So I have generated this energy of, you are the most important person in the world to me. And I abandon it. This is also what we do with people when we film them. Because this is intense stuff. You're like looking someone in the eyes. You're never going to forget me. I'm never going to forget you, right? Like, I will always remember this person who loves Jacques Tati here in this room. Maybe. Or maybe I'll forget it. Can you tell me something about the first time you saw this movie. Where were you? How old were you? I think I was around 20. Mm -hmm. Mm. Where did you see it? Uh, in the cinema, on the first row. Uh huh. Why did you go to see it? Uh, because I've seen uh, Mon Oncle uh -huh. and I uh, really, really loved it. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. And were you with someone? Yes. And do you still stay in contact with that person? You don't know. You don't see that person anymore, right? So suddenly, this story just became more memorable, right? We know she loved playtime. Now we know we saw, she saw it on the first row with someone who she doesn't see anymore. I will not get more intimate than that, right? But when you're filming, here's a clue. Here's the next space. Do I go into that space? Am I allowed in that space? Do you want to tell me more about that story? Yeah. So yes, she does want to tell me more about that story. 
How long were you together? One year. One year. Did he share your sense of humor? <laughs> not sure. Not sure. I'm not sure. Right? So suddenly, I've learned something about what matters to you. Matters to me, too. I would definitely not be with someone who is not sure whether he likes Tati or not. Moving on, right? <laughs> That's not going to work, right? Now I'm really not going to forget her, and she's not going to forget me and not going to forget this moment. If we went even deeper, the relationship between us intensifies. But what kind of relationship is this? We may never see each other again. I can barely remember her name. Right? I wouldn't be able to find her in a crowd. But one of the really powerful things that happened to me after Camera Person, or during the making of it, was I was going back and looking at footage that I had shot 20 years before, 25 years before. And without fail, I recognized the eyes of every person that I had filmed. So I would come back to this footage of our conversation with Jacques Tati and be like, I remember her. So somehow, this act of actually really looking at people, right, it enters us. And what the camera can do is I can be here and I can see, I'm going around you, it's going to be a tough shot to get, but you can't get it. I, from where I was over there, I could look at you in the eyes with the camera, right? So right now, this camera knows what's going on inside of my eyes. I've forgotten that these cameras are filming me. So I'm unguarded. And the camera is going right into here. How different is it when I'm here, close to you? More intense. More intense, right? What's your name? Lisa. Lisa. So it's more intense right here. You are experiencing it in a two-way situation, right? You're seeing my eyes. I'm seeing your eyes. But if I was filming you, that's not so intense for you. But it's super intense for me because my lens is here, right? And when I'm here, Lisa knows that I'm looking, I'm looking at you, right? So you are self-aware, yes. <laughs> right? And you know from experience of what I did over there uh -huh. that I might be looking at your hands. I might be wondering, why are you holding your jacket on your lap? Are you cold? What does it mean? Are you hiding something? What's going on, right? She also has a sense of humor. I don't know. Do you love Jacques Tati? No. Ah, very strongly. <laughs> did you go to Did you go to see Playtime in the theater? Oh no. No, no. you'd never go. I did, but I didn't see that. Film. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we now know these two now know something about each other, right? It may be that they still may become the greatest of friends, and have an argument about the meaning of Jacques Tati for the rest of their lives, right? But you know. You are aware that I am here. Mm -hmm. And in this relationship, we are making decisions about what's OK and what's not OK. How long? You're different than she is. How? You are not uncomfortable with me being here. OK. Are you? Uh, I expected it, maybe. She saw it coming. <laughs> so she prepared a little emotionally. How many of you are preparing emotionally for me to come, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you are like, don't, don't see me. <laughs> don't see me over here, right? Did you think I was going to come over here? Uh, no. Right, right? You didn't think I was going to come over here? Oh, uh, yes. You uh, thought maybe? Yes. You weren't sure. What about you? Did you see me coming? Yeah, you thought I might come, right? Because when this class started, I was up here. And everybody who sat in the back row, they were like, I'm good. I got like some emails to write, and I'll eat my lunch, and she'll never know who I am, right? But you learned, uh-oh, 
She'll move anywhere. She'll do anything. I don't know what she's going to do, which is what happens when we're filming. Our behavior through the whole time that we are interacting with people is being registered by people. So you learn, huh, I'll push people. I will get close to people. I will abandon people. I will learn something very important, and then I will never speak to them again. I'll, we'll keep talking forever, right? right? So all of these things are registering. So this is a thing of how long do you stay when you're making a film, right? Is it, do you go to a place for a half an hour and film some shots and leave and never come back again? You've never been there, you never come back again. Or are you filming with your family and you gotta stay for the rest of your life, right? So that they have all of the history of what they've known you've done and who you are and then suddenly there you are with a camera behaving differently and they're thinking about how will this film impact our family? Or are you staying for a month in a community where everybody knows everybody's business? And maybe in the intimacy of this moment or in the intimacy of this moment, you felt comfortable with me and you trusted me and you revealed something to me. But oops, you didn't realize you were revealing it in front of everybody, right? But as soon as I get up and I walk away and I sit down and start talking to her, you're like, oh, right. Everybody heard me. Everybody can see me. And you become more aware of this dynamic. So you knew I might come for you, right? In the beginning, you didn't know. Now you know. So all of this is part of this sort of relational dynamic of filming. So I'm saying I've got a couple of hours with you. So I'm really like, we're doing this. This is intense, right? If I was going to be with you for a semester, I would be exactly like this. <laughs> because this is who I am. I'm intensely in the present. This is part of why I'm good at being a camera person. Right? I'm like, this is, this is all we got. It's, we're here now. What's your name? Elisa. Elisa. Right? This is, our, this is our moment. We may never again be this close to each other. Turns out maybe it's really important that we know each other, to you. And you're going to say something to me that's going to make me want to know you for the rest of your life. Go ahead. <laughs> no pressure. Right? This is often what we are asking of people, right? Because basically, here's a, we're making a documentary film, and you're like, I need to be in this movie. This really matters to me because I have a story nobody's ever heard. And I know I'm never going to get a chance to tell it, and you're the one. Or, you know, and it can be really extreme and really profound why someone needs to tell you something. So the need is going in both directions. But the relationship to time is very complicated, right? Because this might be it. This might be your only chance to say something to me. But you don't want to say it to me in public. You're going to wait till the coffee break, right? And you're going to assume you'll get your chance. You'll get to talk to me at the coffee break. Turns out I get a call. I got to leave at the coffee break. I'm out of here. You never get a chance to see me again. This is the dynamic that you're managing as a camera person. This may be it. This may be the only chance we get. I'm making it very dramatic, <laughs> right? But so these are the kind of things that are going on inside of us when we're filming and they're going on inside the people who are filming. And this thing of physical proximity is very meaningful. So people talk about cameras distancing us or detaching us, but I feel like cameras are the thing. Look, you got a microphone, right? You're recording this. Will you listen again to this? Yes. Wow. It's a podcast. That's so cool. 
And what happens when you listen to something a second time? What's different for you from when you're listening now and when you go back and listen to something? Um, great question. <laughs> I, I try to remember what happened. Mm -hmm. um, I try to make it more of my being. Mm, what do you mean? Like we're talking, like what you're saying now is very new to me. Yeah. Um, about the relationship and the dynamic of the twin. Yeah. And I try to incorporate it into my everyday life yeah. so that when I have a camera, yeah. I wouldn't think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you think you will pay attention to different things when you hear it again? Yeah. Yeah, right? Because each moment, so right now, tell me your name. Oh, Coven. Coven. So he's taking notes, he's recording, he's focused. And I don't know, like, you know, maybe like he's going to be like running on the treadmill thinking about the film he wants to make. And he'll listen to this, and something that he didn't think was important will suddenly become like, oh, I can't believe I missed that. That was so important to me. This is the other thing that happens when you're being a camera person, right, 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 right. Suddenly, this image just got more interesting. You're getting a little bored with what was happening, right? And now you're seeing things in a whole different way. You can't get focused. I'm too close to the focal plane, right? <laughs> you got to move back. You got to do something, right? You don't understand while you are filming what will be important in the future. So you are recording me. You're listening very beautifully and attentively now. Thank you, Kelvin. You're making me happy, um, right? I feel like you care. It matters to you what I am saying. That helps me continue, right? You're helping me. You're in the relationship with me, helping this work. When you listen to it in the future, you will no longer have this obligation to me, right? Right now, you got to stay with me. You're staying with me. In the future, you, can, you have nothing, no more to prove to me. You don't have to pretend that everything I say is interesting, right? In fact, only like, whatever, like 10% of what I say is interesting. And you may discover that when you listen again. But you then, and this, is, uh, this can be you, Coven, going back and trying to learn from this. Or it might be you in the edit room, right? We filmed together for two hours. Boom. Here's this tiny sentence that really means something. But it's the sentence in which I sound like an idiot. But it's really useful to the film you're making. But you know, like, I gave my heart. I bled. I tried to be articulate. I said a lot of stuff. And you're going to use this 10 minutes where I sound like an idiot. Is that a betrayal of me? Is that a betrayal of this relationship? Maybe, right? It depends. What if I'm someone who, who pretends to be many things publicly, but you know who I am privately? And privately, I'm actually an idiot. And the world needs to know that because I'm doing harm in the world. And you had a mission to reveal what a fraud I am. And you got me, right? You got that little. Then what is your relationship to that piece of information? And I, what I'm saying is none of this stuff is easy, right? You may have, we may have really connected. And you wanted to get me. You wanted to show I was an idiot, and you got the piece of information, but now you're conflicted because you see me as a more full person than you did. Do you now create a portrayal of me that includes that I am an idiot, but I'm also very earnest, and I believe myself. I'm very sincere, whereas you just thought I was cynical? Yeah, maybe, because maybe that's more interesting and more painful.
that that person believes themselves and is also a fraud, rather than they're just a fraud and they have no emotional attachment to it. So these are the things you learn through filming, right? Because that two-hour interview is never making it into the film. You're going to go into the edit room and choose a fragment. So all of this work is fragmentary, right? So I think I'm going to show you something now, because you've been listening to me talk for too long. Um, so I'm going to, uh, hello, Nancy. I'm going to see if our technology works. Yes. Oh, nice. I, I, I'm just going to let you do it, because it's so exciting and fun. Will you please look up uh, the above? Look up Field of Vision, the above. I'll help you find it once we. So um, let me set this. Has, has anyone seen this short film I made called The Above? So let me, I'll set it up for you a little bit. So if you, I'll look for it. OK, there it is. So, so um, I went to Afghanistan in 2009. And I um, thought I went because I was supposed to make a film. Someone gave me some money to go make a film about girls going to school in Afghanistan. And I knew I didn't really want to make a film about that, so I was trying to figure out what I was going to make a film about, which is often the case, right? Like, you're like, you have, you get a, you have either, you have some reason that you have to do it, like an assignment, or you have someone who has given you money to do something, or you just don't understand anything about anything yet, so you don't really know what you're doing, or, you haven't really thought about why you're making a movie in the first place. But suddenly, you find yourself in a place with a camera, and you're beginning to search. So I was searching for this movie. I worked on it. I went away. I came back. And when I came back to Kabul, uh, there was something new in the sky. And so. It had nothing to do with the movie that I was making, but I began filming it. So this film is about uh, eight minutes long. Um, but just so you know, I had no idea I was making this film when I was shooting this footage. Does that make sense? I thought I was making something completely different. So in the way that Joe, is that right? When Joe was filming, she was making the decision, do I frame in the camera person or frame them out? I was doing this thing of like framing in this thing because it was just visually interesting to me. I couldn't not look at it. So you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. The film um, begins and it's very quiet. It will, there will be sound, but you don't be afraid of the quiet. Um, can we hit the lights and we will play this. So it's eight minutes. Yeah, I'm listening. You said that um, you didn't know what you were going to do before right. at some point. Right. At some point, right. What's the point? Maybe part of that intuitive. Like, maybe it changed intuitively things at one point, and then it changed more What's fascinating to me is that I knew as soon as I saw the blimp that it was, that I must film it, right? Because it's just so extraordinary visually, right? And I had no idea that, so I'm an American citizen, right? And I go to Kabul. I had no idea we had surveillance blimps in the air filming people. It was not reported at the time. And I was doing some filming uh, at the US Embassy. And I said, you know, what is that? And they said, oh, it's classified. You're not allowed to film it. So of course. <laughs> and, and you know, I, I had this like fantasy of like, oh, it has cameras. And it can see me. And 
So at some point I was like, I really want to see the footage of me filming it because it really was like a mirror, right? You know, it's this thing looking back at me. And in some ways, like a total mirror of me, like a big white thing in a foreign place, right? <laughs> like, um, so I just wanted to show you, this camera is like about this big. And I brought this camera uh, to Afghanistan because at the time, it was a high definition camera. Uh, and it was what I could afford. And it was small and inobtrusive and felt like it wouldn't draw a lot of attention to me. But I shot some pretty epic shots with a camera this big. The screen was this big. A lot of times I couldn't even see the blimp in the shot, but I knew it was there, right? So it became this really interesting thing around like, how do I frame this thing? Um, let's go back to it. Um, oh, that didn't go for it. Um, but you're right that it totally changed because so first what I did was I was just, um, you know, I would see it from, from the city, right? So some of the first shots that I shot were uh, like that, right? So, or like a that. But then I was like, wow, where is this thing? because I could literally see it from everywhere in the city. And so I said to someone, what's the highest point in Kabul? Can you take me there? So I went on a hike, right? And I, for the first time, saw that view of Kabul, right? I'd never seen it from that perspective before. I never would have gone to that place unless I wasn't being pulled by the blimp. So this is what happens when we, you know, write stories, make films. You know, you just have your curiosity that belongs to you that you can't even explain what it is. And then it will lead you places that you did not expect to go. So for example, once I got up there, then I realized there was this extraordinary uh, rock wall, right, that was there. And suddenly, I got up there, away from the crash and the crowd of Kabul. And for the first time being in Kabul, I didn't feel fear anymore. And I felt this idea of being above it all. And I felt peaceful, right? And um, one of the things that happens to me when I am in a Muslim country and I hear the call to prayer is that I feel intense nostalgia for my childhood. It is not because I am Muslim, but it is because I really believed in God when I was a kid. And something about hearing the sound of the call to prayer, the way it like comes into my body, it reminds me of really believing. And I also feel very um, watched. Because when I was a kid, I really, there was a Bible verse that said, God knows your thoughts before you think them which I don't know if uh, anyone uh, can imagine what it is to be a child and, and believe that God knows your thoughts. Maybe, are there some people in this room who know that feeling? Maybe, right? And I used to try to beat God to my own thoughts. I thought I would always be like, there's somewhere God can't know what I'm thinking. Uh, which, of course, in many ways, is why I'm interested in the theme of surveillance, right? Because I felt surveilled as a child in my own mind. So it was very sweet. My father, who's a psychiatrist, he saw this film. He was like, this is the most autobiographical film you've ever made, right? And 
I do not say that explicitly in this film, but I connect certain things because they are coming from me, right? So the idea of this, I'm feeling inside of me, and then I wanted to know, what do people think about the blimp? So I'm asking people, asking people. Some people say, oh, the blimp can see through burkas. The blimp can see underground. So then when I see these men who are, uh, you know, it's the shot of men who are burying someone. Uh, I don't know where it is now. Um, so suddenly I think about, I think about that idea, the blimp can see underground, um, and I keep asking people, and then I run into this man who says, God created the brain of the person who created the blimp who can see everything, and I'm like, ugh. <laughs> he is expressing my thoughts, but he is also expressing his thoughts. And we, our Venn diagram is not Jack Tati, but is we both understand what it is to believe in an omniscient God. He believes in a different omniscient God. I no longer believe in an omniscient God, but we share that understanding, right? Even though, you know, in that moment, he's looking at me like, who are you, crazy lady, right? He, he thinks I make no sense in his world, but he's very happy to tell anyone the good news about God. So he wants to share with me. So that was one piece, right, of the project. Like I was just thinking about these thoughts. What in the world was I doing when I filmed the balloons? Do you guys remember that moment? It's a crazy moment, right? Where is it? Anybody know? It's after? Mm. Oh, there's the guy's bearing. It's after this. You know my own. OK. So, so, like, remember what I'm telling you about being a body in space. Like, what did I do to get this shot? I literally walked into a bunch of balloons, right? I'm literally inside the bunch of balloons. So I, why did I do that? I actually made that shot before I had any idea I was making the film about the surveillance blimp. I'm a person who loves color. Kabul is one of the most monochrome places I have ever been. I literally couldn't stand it that I was so color deprived inside of my camera. Everything I was filming was tan. And I couldn't take it. And I saw this kid across the street who had a bunch of balloons. So I got a wide shot of him, and the balloons are in the shot. And literally, as if drawn to candy, <laughs> I went across the street and said hi and tried to talk to him. And you know, it's like, I'm this big American lady with a camera, and he's just like, whoa. But I'm trying, you know, I can't speak his language. We're joking with each other. He's like, do you want to buy a balloon? And, and he like pulls a balloon towards me, and it comes in front of my vision. And I have like orange. I'm like, oh, that feels good. <laughs> and suddenly, I realize I can do that with my camera. So I sort of say to him, no, no, uh, and then I literally follow the string up and go into his balloons, and, and I'm lost inside of there. And the kid was just like, what are you doing, lady? But he was laughing, right? And turns out he had a sense of humor, too. Craziest thing that's ever happened to him, right? And it was fun. 
And once I was in there, I was like, oh, I love this shot. I'm going to stay in this land of color. Whoa. And then because I'm a filmmaker, I think about shots, right? So I, back to Joe's moment, right? Like I have a beginning, which is his hand going up into the balloons. I have the me trapped in the balloons. And then I realize, oh, he's going to walk away. And those two things can cut together, right? So I changed my position. So you're always thinking about cinema language, right? It's, it's, got a, it's got a language. You're thinking about how things can cut together. And part of it is changing your position, going around something in 360 degrees, right? So what could you do right now? You could do that. Or you could just pick this up and go over there, right? So she's going to try to do an impossible thing, which is turn around and film me at this crazy angle, and I'm too close to the camera. You've got to move, right? <laughs> she's got to move. Boom. I moved. You move. You got to just pick that up. You know, just take it away, right? <laughs> so we get really attached to where, like, I'm trying to do something in the right way. I, I'm here. This is where I'm supposed to be when I'm filming a master class. Turns out. I'm different, right? So suddenly she's learned something about me. It could be you decide, like, I'm going off tripod now because this woman will never stay still. <laughs> but you might also know if I go off tripod, I have really poor handheld skills. And I'll have to be really close to her the entire time. And maybe she won't like that. So, you're making a decision in your mind. What's my cinema language? Do I stay on sticks? Do I cut and run and go handheld now? And you're trying to respond to the situation. But the situation is changing. And you're making a calculation about the future. How is this going to cut together? So all of those things are going on in your mind, right? So me with the balloons, I just did that. And then when I learned that the blimp was tethered, I was like, oh, that's so cool. It's like a balloon just in the sky. And then another day, I saw a balloon stuck in a tree, that green balloon at the end stuck in a tree. I probably would have shot that shot anyway because it made me think of the red balloon, right? Because we have shared. Some of us have seen it, some of us haven't. But we have a shared history of moving images. Did anyone think of the red balloon when they were watching this movie? Right? So, so we build upon this history of images. And so, like, remember, I'm shooting with a tiny camera, but look at this world that's in front of me, right? Like, Incredible, these blown out giant government buildings of Kabul, these incredible big mountains. And one of the things that I think about when I film is get as far away from something as possible and get as close to something as possible. Get as far above something as possible. And now we have drones to do this for us, right? Or get up under it. But imagine. Don't even just imagine three dimensions. Imagine four dimensions. Imagine 11 dimensions. Uh, how many of you are aware of quantum physics? Right? A little bit? So there's crazy ideas in quantum physics that none, we basically don't understand our universe in any kind of way. We don't know how many dimensions there are. And there's a principle called entanglement. Some of you saw this in camera person last night, right? There's a physicist who talks about entanglement. So entanglement is crazy. And I'm really, I'm, this, is, this has been proven. I'm not just a crazy person, even though it seems crazy. You can take two little photons, and they might be spinning together. And what scientists can do is separate those two photons at vast distances. And they start spinning one in the opposite direction instantaneously, faster than the speed of light. That photon will change directions. 
they don't understand how it works. So I think about this all the time. So you know, we know in this, the universe, like a huge percentage of the universe is dark matter. It's basically, we know it's there, we don't know what its dimensions are. I think about this in filming all the time. Somehow we are recording the unknown. And maybe in the future, it will come together in a way that we don't expect. So this is my sort of leap of faith when I film. So like you were saying, I can't remember your name, tell me again. Tess. Tess. So like Tess was saying, like, this movie must have changed. Of course it did, because it wasn't a movie in the beginning. It was just a set of shots, right, of the blimp. So I, I shot, remember how I told you, like, get as high as you can, get as low as you can. What was my lowest shot? Can anyone remember what my lowest shot was? The carrots, right? That was a kooky shot. There it is. That's a crazy shot. <laughs> That's a crazy shot. I literally laid on the ground in the middle of a marketplace in Kabul to get that shot. And I don't know why, I don't know what possessed me, but it was, it, what possessed me was going further and further of like anywhere I am, I can see the blimp. So I collected all these shots. The movie I was making fell apart. And I just, in the back of my mind was like, oh, I love those shots. And then one day, I was reading the paper in the United States, and I hear they put up a blimp in Maryland. And literally, like the next day, I got in my car and drove to Maryland and looked for the blimp. And suddenly, I had the, I was like, I have a movie, <laughs> right? And I shot for an afternoon in Maryland and waited and waited and waited for that flag to blow in front of the blimp, like, an hour, <laughs> right? And then I worked with a researcher to learn everything I could about the blimp. And I found that statement. Keep the balloon in the air. It doesn't matter whether it's the camera or not. Everyone thinks they're being watched. And I was like, boom, right? And I had a movie. It was five years between when I filmed the shots in Kabul and when I finished the movie. And it feels to me like there, there was some dark matter in there, right? Like, it's what I filmed. Um, should we take a little break? And you have a, a social obligation, right? Maybe uh, it's just you are part of the press crew, you have to stand in the back. Or it's the social obligation of, Nobody said it's okay for her to come up and be in this space, right? Um, and in that case, all those other cameras would be getting in each other's shots. You can't suddenly be the, oh, I'm the camera person who wants to come film over here, and everyone else has to frame around you, right? But I think in many instances, we learn about photography in that kind of way. Stand here, you stand there, don't move. Now get the wide shot, get the medium shot, get the coverage, right? And we're all like, oh, I'm so bored. And the th I would say the thing about all of us now is we all are watching an incredible range of material. And we all have really sophisticated uh, visual vocabulary as seers. And so that many of the traditional modes of the way things are filmed, we can look at them in a second and know whether we want to look at them or not, right? Um, but it's not, it's, it's not you, you don't only get high production values or interesting images out of having lots of equipment and uh, lots of time to set up. 
you can get really, who's ever seen that image before? Right? That's a really weird image. <laughs> but you, you know enough, there's enough references in images that I've made. And I wanted to go back and show you this one shot from the very beginning. That shot. I was so pleased when I made this shot. Because what happens in this shot is, how satisfying is that? Right? That's really satisfying on an aesthetic level. Right? And you know what that was? Remember what I showed you in the very beginning? It was a this. I moved that much with my teeny tiny little camera. I moved that much. And it made, it made this happen. It made the whole image activate as a, a graphic image, as something that says, like, you don't even know what that says to you, right? Like, it's abstraction. But it's, it is, you see intention. You know that I, who created this image, I, I have, I'm, I'm doing something. You don't know what I'm doing, but you know I'm doing it with purpose, with intention. Now, if I had moved a tiny bit this way, his head would have been in the mountain, and it would have been, but maybe that would have made a cool shape too. And maybe I shot that shot too, where his head became the mountain. That's another way to do that, and that's a moving, like this. So this is, for me, one of the great joys of camera work and not being bored, right? That suddenly, in moving this tiny inch, wow, I please myself. I thrill myself. I didn't see that relationship. Now I see it. And so that in these sort of infinitesimal changes in moment to moment, suddenly you're surprising yourself. Everybody come in, all you people who are standing, come sit, there's chairs, come, come. So this, this thing of like sort of always keeping yourself activated and always keeping yourself searching for what is beautiful, what is telling the story, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you get to that place? What, why, how do you engage like that? So one of the things that I do, um, if we go back, to the beginning when we're talking about, are you collaborating with other people? Uh, or are you making things by yourself? In this case, I was all alone. I was the director, the sound person, the camera person. Most of the time, I'm working with a director. And if you take this story of how I made this film, I was drawing upon my inner story, drawing upon the fact that I believed in an omniscient God when I was a kid. And I was drawing upon years of loving paintings, of loving movies, and so I shot that shot, right? I, I have, I'm, I'm searching to do something on a compositional level, on an artistic level. How do you, if you are collaborating with someone, share how do you create a common language? How do you figure out what you're doing if you don't know what you're doing? So <clears throat> one, of my, one of my images that I love the most is um, the image of our unconscious mind uh, that is, imagine a tiger, imagine a monkey, sitting on the back of a tiger, facing the opposite direction with a steering wheel attached to nothing. The monkey believes the monkey is driving. <laughs> In fact, the tiger is taking the monkey somewhere the monkey does not know. So this is, <coughs> this is a great idea of the, I need water. This is a great idea of the, the image of our unconscious mind. We think we're driving. We're actually a monkey with a disconnected steering wheel riding on the back of a tiger. We don't, so 
I think none of us know really why we are making the project we are making. So if you're collaborating with someone, how do you get a common language if you have no idea what you're making? Um, thank you. One more. Oh, you guys are the best. <laughs> so I believe, especially when people are working on long-term projects like an you know, an independent documentary where you're working on a film that takes years to make and you're making a feature-length film, uh, or, or you're working on a deeply investigative journalistic piece, or you're making some short film like this, you're doing some deep investigation you don't totally understand. And so I worked with a woman, um, on a film uh, about her mother's suicide. So maybe I'll <clears throat> just show you the trailer for it if I can. Kirsten, yeah. Can I ask you, um, this film is about? Yeah. What was your, your shooting racial? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? How much material have you shot to cut this? I think I used every shot I shot of the blip. Because I wasn't making a movie about a blimp. I was just occasionally shooting the blimp when I saw the blimp. Um, and as I told you, shooting the blimp made me curious about the blimp. Because you couldn't tell how big it was. So one day, I, I, I say, I'm going to try to find where it is tethered. So I went driving around and around. I spent the whole day driving, looking for where it was. Because they weren't going to tell me, right? Because it's classified. And I just would get closer and closer. And that's how I got that shot of it. There was another one grounded on the ground. And that was the first time I could understand its scale. So it's like a one-to-one -one ratio, <laughs> that movie. You know, like. Because it wasn't the movie I thought I was making. So let me, I'm just going to show you this. First started making it, like I said, she couldn't say the word suicide. And so my assumption was Kathy needs to make this film so she can process the loss of her mother's suicide, right? Uh, which is a very huge thing and very uh, brave thing to do. You know, it's very uncomfortable to talk about mental illness, to talk about suicide. Um, and I didn't understand how uncomfortable it was till I started working on this process. Um, so how did, we, how did we begin to proceed? We began to proceed by talking about, you know, what do you want to film? What are the themes in this movie? What are you looking for? So uh, it turned out her mother had jumped out of the window of the apartment where Kathy now lives. And this is a, I think this is like a Hong Kong story also, because New York is so crazy with real estate. They had a really nice apartment. And even though her mother jumped out the window, the family doesn't want to give up the apartment. Right? It's rent controlled. <laughs> it's rent controlled. So it's this like crazy, terrible situation. Uh, and so she's living in this house. So, and there is the window that her mother has jumped out of. So I know, as a camera person, we're going to be filming in the apartment. Window is a visual theme, right? And also, that courtyard down below is a thing. But 
I'm working with a director who can't speak the word suicide. So she can barely get near anything. She doesn't want me to film near the window. And in fact, it's an apartment that is a historic old building and everything has had to be changed, but the family has never changed the window because literally no one can touch the window. It's like a memorial in this house that you can't touch. So I know I have to be very careful with this person because she can't say the word suicide. She doesn't want me to film the window. She doesn't want me to film in the house. We don't want to talk to the people who found her mother. Uh, you know, the, the list sort of goes on and on of all the things we can't do. Very strange, right? Why is this person making this film if they can't approach any of it? But this is often the case, right? That there's this real tension between what someone says they want to do and what they're able to do and what you're doing. Especially if someone is making a personal movie. Now, in some ways, what I contend is people are always making personal movies. It's just whether or not you know how to read the personal information in the movie. So the above that I showed you is an autobiographical movie, even though it's about the surveillance blimp <laughs> in Afghanistan. So with this situation with Kathy, we talk about what we want to do, and we go, and we talk about movies we're interested in, we talk about the way mental illness has been depicted in movies. We watch movies together. So we're building a vocabulary together. I'm learning about what's inside of her, what is inside of Kathy. I'm finding out that she loves Jacques Tati, right? Because I, I don't know that from looking at her. It's in, inside of her. So little by little, in these kinds of conversations, and in learning what the limits in the house are. So then I learn the house is full of the mother's stuff. You open a drawer, it's full of the mother's medications. And this is 10 years after the mother has committed suicide. So of course, I am filming the drawers full of medications. The mother has left little notes with handwriting all over the house. So I'm filming the handwriting. And then you open a closet, and there are notebooks. So we are opening the notebooks and filming the notebooks. But then Kathy is saying, no, I don't want to film the notebooks. So you take steps and take steps back, right? But you're starting to build this vocabulary together, where the mo I can see how crazy the mother's handwriting is. But Kathy has no. There's, very, there's still photos of the mother. She has no recordings of the mother. She has a couple of Super 8 movies. So how are we going to make a movie about this woman who's disappeared? We can't talk about suicide, right? Um, in terms of filming her writing, yeah. you were talking about reveal earlier. Yeah. Like, there's only a certain amount of stuff you can do with filming like um, papers. So right. How did you experiment with that while you were? Right. Um, Great question. Right? So like, how do, how do you experiment with it? Because you know, like, oh, I don't want to watch a movie that's only writing. But in that same way that I'm searching both aesthetically, you come across the word pain. And then you say, oh, I see pain here. I see pain there. And then you start to do close-ups of pain. But in that case, like, what was my ratio? I filmed hours and hours of this woman's notebook. And I read the words. I would go across. I searched in the word for clues. The more I got to know her, we revisited the notebooks, filmed them again. It was like my thinking was coming through in the filming. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to film this line. I'm going to film this page. Same way of like what we saw outside. People lined up filming medium shot. You're trying to film your curiosity. So you're using your curiosity as you film, right? 
So I was searching in the notebooks to understand. I didn't understand why the mother had committed suicide. I didn't understand why Kathy wanted to make the film. But what I did know was she's this incredibly uh, emotionally brave person. So I was interested in making the film with her, right? So you're both thinking aesthetically of like, how can I frame this in interesting ways? But you're thinking about content, right? And you're searching. And in that kind of case, it's OK to overshoot. You're shooting with intention, right? But you're also trying to figure out, what is my intention? So here we go. We're working. And time is passing. Years are going by. She has one baby. She has another baby. And then the children are in the house. And the children are going near the window. And she knows she needs to change the window. And little by little, we film scenes. So finally, she gets to the place where they're going to repair the window. And I'm there to film on that day. And it's just extraordinary because they're ripping the window out of the building with like this violence. And then it's just a full drop, and it's open air. And Kathy is hiding in the kitchen because she can't stand it. And the guy who's repairing the window is just climbing outside of the window. And he has no idea what's gone on, right? And he's really comfortable being in this space. So suddenly I have this sort of incredible metaphor, emotional metaphor. And they take the plastic cloth to cover uh, the table and the furniture. But Kathy has gotten this beautiful bouquet of flowers that she has put on the windowsill that morning to commemorate her mother. And he takes the flowers, and he spreads this cloth. And it looks visually like a casket and like the draping of the and because I am thinking about story and images, I'm suddenly filming what looks like this dead body in the middle of the room, because it's a wide shot. And you have this window that's wide open. And it's like the whole story visually in one shot. And I can't have imagined this, but in my, you know, it's like a catalog of themes that you're running through in the moment as it's happening. And you realize, whoa, I have to get the wide shot where I see the whole length of the table because it is the body, right? No one told me, go film a wide shot now because you need a tight shot and a medium shot and a wide shot. It's because it has meaning. And you are discovering the meaning, and you are filming it with intention and compositional intention, right? So these are the things that are. But the remarkable thing with this story is we just keep filming and keep filming. And I learn all these, keep learning all these things about the mother. But now it's three years, four years, five years, six years, seven years that we are making this film. And I maybe will shoot on it a week a year. And I'm a little bit like, when is this movie going to end? <laughs> right? I've learned lots of things about the mother. And I'm thinking, I know what it is. She needs to move out of the house. Right? She's making this movie so she can leave behind this house. Right? And I'm like, that's the end of the movie. Obvious, right? That, that, I'm like, I understand why she's doing this. And then one day, we uh, are going, you know, there's lots of stuff in the house, and we're taking it out and taking it out because I'm filming everything. All of the things she has been afraid to look at, because I need to film it, we're pulling it out. And when we are pulling something out, we find a box of tapes. And there is her mother's voice. And her mother has recorded hundreds of hours of things. And 
for a long time, Kathy was saying, I just have to throw out all this stuff. I just need to throw it out. But then she couldn't because she couldn't let go of her mother. And then the only way she could save her mother was to have me film everything. So, you know, I was filming her clothes, the notebooks, like I had to film everything. But it was like an unearthing process she was going through. And then we found these tapes. And then it was like, oh my gosh, now she's got the movie, right? But no, <laughs> she listens to all the tapes. We keep filming. And really now I'm like, she has everything. Like, okay, she's learned all about the mental illness. She's learned all about the suicide. We have everything. So finally, we are, and all during this whole period, her brother has refused to be in the movie. And we all respect this. Her brother's never going to be in the movie. So they have like a country house up in the north part of New York. And everyone is visiting there. And they have more papers there. And Kathy's saying, we have to film more papers. And I'm like, ugh. Talk about wanting to kill yourself, right? Like, I'm like, oh, I have to film more papers. I can't do it. But we're there, and her father and she are looking at love letters from the mother and the father. Very happy, beautiful scene between the two of them. They're talking. And all of a sudden, the brother walks into the room. And I don't move. I happen to be, so let's see, if you were, so we have to make the, tri so here's the triangle. Nancy, you're here, you're Kathy, you're the father, and I'm, I'm here, right? And because I've been filming them talking to each other. The brother comes over and sits here, right? So he sits behind me, uh, and I know he doesn't want to be filmed, but he knows that we're filming in the room, and I am filming. And he comes in and sits down and starts looking at letters. So what do I do? Do I say, oh, do you want to be filmed? No. <laughs> right? He would, say no. he would say no. But he also knows what he is doing, right? He has come into the room where we were filming. Do I do this? No. Right? We know this is a very fragile situation. And I know Kathy wants him to be filmed. So right now, I have a two shot, right? I've got, I can focus on Kathy. I can focus on the dad. Brothers over here. I want to be as inobtrusive as possible, right? So they are talking to each other, and I just, Do you see me moving? Do you hear me moving? I'm moving. I'm still moving. Oh, and if we say he, here he is, that's the brother. Suddenly I can see the brother. But the brother can still see me turning towards him. So I just go a little further back. Now I've got a three shot. And now I've got a one shot. A one shot, a one shot. Now, I love cinema. I love a shot counter shot. Should I get up and go over here and shoot this while they're talking to each other? No, right? That scene will be over. So I commit. I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. And I can do this. And I can do that, and I can do that, and I can do that. In the most discreet way possible, making no sound. And I'm also realizing something's happening. The brother is very angry. The scene I was filming was a love story daughter talking, father, uh, and I can feel his anger. But he's also, it's like dangerous. I, 
I know if he sees me, he could throw me out of the room. So remember this thing of eye contact, right? I don't want him to see me seeing him. So I'm filming the father when he starts talking to the father. And then when the father is talking to him, I'm filming him, but I'm looking over here. Right? And my camera is sort of this way, so he can't really see that I'm. And starts this fight. I've been working on this film for eight years. <laughs> I know everything about this family. In this fight, I learn I know nothing about this family. I know nothing about what was happening at the moment of the suicide. I certainly don't know. The father and the brother have never spoken about the suicide. And it's happening now in front of my camera. And I would say it is happening because of the camera. Right? It is also happening because of Kathy, who didn't know it. Of course she's making this film to deal with her mother's suicide. Of course she's doing it because there's too much shame about mental illness. Of course she's doing it because she wants to be an activist about changing people's ideas about mental illness. But without even knowing it, she is making the film because she wants her brother and her father to speak to each other again. And they have not spoken to each other in a decade in a real way. This is why we have been filming for nine years. Right? She finished those other movies a long time ago, but this is what she needs to finish, right? And I mean, I'm not breathing, and I'm not alone. There's a sound person <laughs> in the room who is standing up, who is a very wise sound person, this wonderful woman named Judy Karp. And in the middle of this incredibly delicate situation, what happens? Outside, there's a snowblower. A man has come to blow the snow off the yard. And this is what always happens when you are making a movie. It is like the universe. This is the dark matter of the universe, right? So this family has hired the man with the snowblower. All we have to do is yell out the window and say, hey, turn it off. What happens if you do that? Over. Judy is smart enough to know this is going to be lousy sound, but we've been waiting a decade for this fight. And I'm not going to interrupt it either. So this is a thing when we get trained to make technically perfect work, we think, oh, I have to get this kind of shots, or I have to have this kind of clean sound. But in fact, why are we making these things in the first place? Is we're trying to understand deep things. We're trying to, uh, Arthur Miller said this thing, the role of the artist is to discover what is hidden. Right? We are trying to discover what is hidden. So it's happening. It's about to unhide itself, right? And we are compromised. But we are not completely compromised. We can get it. We can get the scene. And the sound will have this mm, sound underneath it. But who cares? Because we will have the scene, right? If this was an interview with an important person and you could stop and stop the sound without killing the interview, great. Do it. But in this case, no, <laughs> don't do it. And so, you know, this incredible moment happens between the father and the brother. And I filmed it in a way that it can be cut. I didn't just freeze and hold it in a three shot the entire time because I couldn't decide where to move, right? Because in, you would have no scene. You would have 40 minutes of people yelling at each other that you couldn't cut. You're still making a movie. 
And that's the challenge of like the past present thing I talk about, right? You're in the present. If you make a false move, you destroy the present. But if you get so caught up in the moment that you freeze, you have no movie in the future. So you are inhabiting these two spaces simultaneously and hopefully you don't make a fatal mistake like trying to cut the sound, right? So for me, this is the beauty of making films. It's like, you, I had no idea. I thought I knew I was wrong. And somehow we have this scene and then Kathy finishes the movie very shortly afterwards and the movie goes out into the world and her and her father, the father and brother are like speaking about the movie publicly. They complete, completely shifts their relationship. So you say, do movies change the world? All we know, it changed us five people, right? But every time I go see this movie, there are people crying in the hallways. You know, like, it's a very difficult thing to talk about suicide, turns out. It took a long time for her to be able to speak it and then convert it into a way what she had inside could be shared on the outside. Um, quite, that? Yeah, where was she? She was right behind me. And she did not kneel down, but she did the same thing I did, which is just like slight. <laughs> just move it like she had a boom and just slight angling, right? Not, <laughs> right? And she's doing the same thing. She's working the compromise. I really want to get closer because the snowblower is going. But if I enter his peripheral vision in this moment, scene's over. So it's listening. And this is a great, for me, like, I think I shot the first five years as a camera person without listening to anything. Put on some headphones, because listening is how you see. And we who love camera, we love composition, right? Like, we're like, oh, it's like I'm framing all these beautiful shots. But I have no idea. Like, the fight's going on over here. You got to hear it to be able to turn towards it. So, and the other thing that's happening, cinema is layers, right? So it's image and sound and context. And everything doesn't have to say the same thing at the same time. So I'm filming, the two of you are talking, and you say something really harsh to her. I hear that. What do I want to see when I'm hearing that? I want to see how she reacts. Because I know, I could see your contorted, angry face, right? But I hear your anger. What I don't know is, how does that affect her, right? So you're always trying to think, like, all of these things can stack up. So if I'm seeing her shocked face as I hear this angry thing, I have a story. If I just see her angry face saying something, I have no story. Or I have a, less of a story, right? A less complex story. Do you have questions? Yeah. How do you decide whether or not to bring the child into the interior? Right. For example, right. So sometimes you, you make a commitment to a tripod, right? You're like, I, this film is about a certain kind of aesthetics, and I really, it's, it's uh, symmetry is part of the movie. And you're like, I want to shoot everything on a tripod. And you could totally, like, that could have totally worked, right? I could be in that house and be in that position and be on a tripod and get all of those shots. 
I was working in a different way because my friend Kathy moves a lot. So I, all that film I had shot handheld. And then suddenly I had to be there for 40 minutes without uh, getting tired. So then it goes back to the body, like how do you use your body so that your, I wasn't, when I demonstrated to you, I don't know if I can, you can see, but I, I, like you don't just like sit up on the toes of your feet. For, you can't handle that, right? You've got to find a way where you can stay with something. One great uh, gift I will give you is the gift of the rice bag. I use a rice bag. Any country I go into, any place I go, you can just get a one pound bag of rice and you use it as a tripod. You can put it in your bag and you just set it down and then you just put the camera into it and then you can get level and you have a level steady shot as if you have a tripod. Now I can't put the rice bag here but I can balance the rice bag on top of here, set it here, I can put the rice bag here and so if you're in a place where you have to like go on some long crazy hike up into the mountains in Tibet, maybe you can even no, the rice bag is still good because then you can eat it if you need to later. <laughs> and you can give it to the people that you filmed with, which is great. And you can get some more, right? But, but you, can, you, you have a way of creating a level and a steady thing. So I often will, like in a situation where I have to be gone all day, I'll bring a rice bag with me and then I can just start putting it places. But it's part of your aesthetic decision making with the film, a part of the visual vocabulary that you're creating. And you hope you understand what you're filming and what your needs are. Um, oh, I'm going to show you something. It makes me want to show you a different film. That's, has anyone seen All These Sleepless Nights? Oh, so good, right? Who's seen it? Um, so, so this is this young Polish director, and he wanted to make a documentary about being young. And he uh, he was someone who had gone done a lot of partying and gone to a lot of parties, and he wanted to make a film about that world, right? And you know, this is a world of where like people stay up all night dancing on the side of beaches. They're in the city, like. How how do you make a documentary about that, right? So his intention is, I wish to make a film about what it feels like to be young. Documentary of the emotion of being young. So he starts thinking about it and he realizes it's sort of, it's impossible to do in an observational way. You walk into a party with a camera, some people will see you, tell you to stop, the music's too loud, you won't be able to hear anything. How is he going to make this movie? And he is at a party and he sees these two guys dancing together. And he's like, wow, they're really interesting. I really like the way they dance. Uh, I want it like they look like the way I feel about my youth. Those are my guys. So he starts talking to them and they're cool guys and they're like, yeah, we'll make a film with you. And so what he does, he creates this sort of amazing rig where the camera is suspended in front of him. He can, uh, go for hours and hours like he's got all of the stuff and he can it's you know like a like a mini steady cam rig and he also starts to find out with them which party you're going to when are you going to go there da, 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 who are the, and then he'll talk to the people whose house the party's going to be at and say is it okay if i come and just check out where you're going to have the party and he puts some well-placed lights in the party. 
And then his guys just come to the party. And they meet people, and they talk to people, and he just, and lots of the people were drunk and on drugs, so there's like a lot of like, you're like a lot of getting permission after the fact of things <laughs> happening. But, but he and these guys basically are in a collaboration together of making this film where these guys are like, yeah, you can film our lives for a year. And these guys really end up fighting with each other, end up falling in love with the same girl, falling apart, like all these things are happening. But they're not recording with sound because the sound would never be possible. They have overdubbed this entire mu movie, re-recorded scenes of sound, of people talking, of the conversation. They got like a track of like what the conversation was, but then they re-recorded over it. And so the movie feels like you're inside their heads because the intention of the movie is to make a movie about what does it feel like to be young. So it's a total, like, I took a bunch of documentary students to see this, and they were like, this is not a documentary. <laughs> and I was like, it feels like a documentary of emotion to me. And these two guys, they were, they were letting the director be in their lives. And, you know, there's all kinds of sort of amazing choreography in this movie where they're like <coughs> dancing in the middle of the street and there's this moment in Poland where uh, all the cars stop at a certain moment to acknowledge some moment in World War II. And so there's this like incredible scene of them dancing in the middle of the street and there's all of these cars stopped. That's so cinematic and makes you think of Fellini. And they've got it from a couple of angles. Well, they did it, I think, three years in a row, right? So we filmed it one year from that side, the other year from this side, the other year from that side. So there is all kinds of construction in the film and artifice in the film and things left out in the film. But I would argue in many ways, like, that's what movies always do, right? It's did Joe film include the camera or not include the camera, right? And in some ways, you're always in a collaboration with the people you're making the film with, their agreement or not to participate in the film. But it manifests in many different ways. Um, and so for me, I, I, this movie is like, it's a, in such a great space because then, hilariously, it was released in Poland as a fiction film. Why? Because those boys didn't want their parents <laughs> to believe they did all that stuff. <laughs> so, so this is, you know, there's sort of all these different strategies in the world with filmmaking now, right? So I'm going to show you uh, another crazy thing. Yeah. I have a question about consent. For yeah. How far do you go with the consent in making documentary? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a perfect question to ask in this situation, right? Like, all these people are at these parties. Uh, and I'm pretty sure, like, you know, there are different laws in different places, right? Around uh, how to have someone's permission. In the United States, for example, if you have a camera in the street and you're filming someone in public, you have the right to do that, and they, if they, you know, can escape from you, they do. So, you know, I have this hilarious moment filming with Michael Moore where he's waiting on the corner with me, and Congress people are running away from him. They do not want to speak to him. And I'm filming them running away. Right? They have more power than he does, and more power than I do. And so I, I, am, I am filming them running away. If it was someone coming up out of the subway saying, don't film me, I'm trapping them like fish in a barrel. It's not fair. It's like what I did to you this morning, right? It, I have more power than them. And if they don't want to be filmed, I should let them not be filmed. In this case, 
if you're filming people at the party, and there's one young woman in the party who is the woman they both fall in love with, and one of them's kissing her, and she was drunk when it happened, and they got her consent after the party, and she found out they were making this film, and she agreed she was in love with one of the guys, and she came into the film and into the story and agreed to be in it. They wouldn't have been able to keep making the film without her consent because she is, a, she is an active player in the movie, right? So it's always changing the issues of consent and concern. There's the legal thing and then there's the human thing. So those of you who are a camera person last night, I talked about I filmed a young woman in Afghanistan for um, three years. I had her consent on a piece of paper. When the film was finished, the political situation had completely changed and smartphones were now in Afghanistan. So when I started filming, no one would ever be able to see the movie about her. When I finished, her neighbors who were Taliban sympathizers could see her in the movie with her face uncovered saying things they didn't like and they could come and hurt her family. So I have a piece of paper that's her consent. Do I show her in the movie or don't show her? Right? This becomes a moral question and I decide, okay, I'm not going to do that. So I'm giving up three years of working on a film because I think maybe she, someone might get hurt. So these things are always changing. We can't have a, I think we have a responsibility to the people we film, but we also can't know how that responsibility is going to change in the future, right? Um, but I do think that you are, you have the obligation. You're the one with the camera, you're the one with the power, and you know what context you're going to put it into. Right? So you have to interrogate your own power. Other questions? Yeah? Um, when you were saying they read up, like re recorded yeah. uh, dialogue and things yeah. like that, was, I, I guess, like, you, you, did you mean, because I haven't seen the film, yeah, so yeah. They, could, they could make out, like, what the conversation was, and then did they re interview the subjects? Or, um, they had them perform the actual words. Right. And then in, sometimes, in some situations, I think that they rewrote what was said. Like, so it's a, it's a very slippery movie in that way, right? And there's voiceover in it and all that kind of thing. Yeah, but they, much of the time, they, but I think that they may have done that, of like interviewed you, how did you feel? And then they wrote the voiceover based on how they felt. Like it's a very, you know, sort of moving target in that movie. Yeah, that's, that's it. We got it. It's awesome. Um, other questions? Yeah. Actually, it's interesting because I first saw it, it was labeled as fiction. Uh huh. Then, the second time I saw it, it's state government. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have a different feeling, feeling about yeah. this film. Yeah. It was, so, it's really like, it's a nice movie, it's a lot of stream of consciousness. Yeah. When I saw it, it's really beautiful. But when I see it again, yeah. the documentary is the shock. Yeah, right? You're like, what's going yeah. on? I have this experience with this cra there was a crazy. Um, Australian film that is about uh, um, a woman who writes a book about an honor killing. Uh, you know, an honor killing uh, in a Muslim society where a father has killed his daughter. So they're making the film about the woman who, she escaped this, but turns out the woman has made everything up. And the filmmaker realizes it midpoint into the movie. And the woman who's made up the story is such a good liar that the director is completely confused of what is true and not true. And I, as a viewer, when I saw it, I was sure it was a fiction film trying to parody a documentary. <laughs> And I'm watching, it's like, oh, documentaries are never this bad. This is so impossible. Ugh. And then afterwards, I learned it was all true. And I was like, what? And I rewatched, just like you. Like, so this is this interesting thing around context, right, in our relation to seeing something, 
it was a completely different movie for you with the different label on it. Yeah. Other people, other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> Going back to your last movie, the the woman with the suicide. Yeah. So I noticed the uh, trailers made back in 2012. Yeah. That make me think, like, do you have like a, a lot of this unfinished movie? Some like a, or do you try to like finish one, or you just do have like a lot of no unfinished yeah. pieces in your pocket and. Uh, just well, so so I, you know, the way I survive economically, <laughs> which is an. Important question for all of us: How do we survive economically? Um, is that you know I in the beginning of being a filmmaker I was like ah, I'm going to be a director, right? And I want to make independent films. Turns out it, it takes some time to make films. It takes time to figure out what they are, and nobody's just paying you to make a movie. So how do you how do you find your way? What do you do? And so. I had trained a little bit in camera work, and I liked camera work, and I realized, oh, I can shoot movies for other people, and this way I can earn a living, and then also work on my own films at the side. And so I've shot like some crazy number of films, like 60 films, that I have filmed for other people. And along the way, I've always been directing and thinking about films I want to make, but when I made this film in Afghanistan and it fell apart, I started thinking about the footage I had shot. And I actually returned to all of the directors I'd worked with and asked them if I could look at the footage that I had shot and if I could make a film out of it. And all of these directors agreed, which is like a crazy miracle. <laughs> um, I'll show, why don't I show the trailer of Camera Person just for those of you who didn't see it last night. Um. Oh, and we're going to go to lunch soon. Exciting. These different films that I shot for that I never imagined I would put together in this way. Um, and I think this often, you know, is the case with film, we, we don't know what is going to become history or when we are going to be in history or when we were in history until it happens, right? Until you can look back at it. Um, but I, um, I, didn't, I didn't own any of the footage I had shot. I was a camera person for hire working on other films and all of that material belonged to other people. But in many ways with camera person, I'm questioning what it means to own footage, right? Because in some ways, who does it belong to? The people who have been filmed, the people, the directors, the camera person who filmed it. Uh, this idea even that we can own images uh, is now a really interesting question, right? So I'm, I'm throwing all of those things into question with this film and throwing all these very big dilemmas around consent and permission. Like, there are no easy answers to any of this and no simple answers to it. So that was part of the project of the film in many ways is to talk about permission, talk about the ownership of images, um, and how the meaning of images changes over time, and depending whether you think you're watching a documentary or you think you're watching a fiction, right? All of those things are going on. Um, yeah? Right. Um, just because you're always moving on to new projects, and right. you have to understand how to uh, like yeah. maintain a relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such a great question. So, I mean, I think the thing that you think about is like, you get to define how you want to be in the world, work in the world, make films in the world. Right? That is actually your decision to make. The thing is, though, we don't live in a vacuum, and we, ha we are a part of a social landscape, and we're part of a, a, an industry, and we're part of a filmmaking culture, right? So, you, and it's all changing. So, you know, I would have said early in my career, I would have said, I want to ask permission of everybody that I film, 
And if I have a super meaningful relationship with someone, I want to continue it and honor it. Turns out, if I get hired to go on a film, I go to a place, I might meet 30 people like I did. I went to Darfur. I met 30 people who had had all family members killed. I spoke with each of them for a couple of hours, had this really intense experience with them. We left and went to another city. I will never see any of those people again. I don't even know their names, right? And I am working for hire for the director who set that up, and then we left. Now, I can say, oh, I never want to do that again. But in fact, we filmed some incredible testimonies. It made it into the film. So over the course of my career, I realized I was not in control of anything other than what do I do in this moment? And can I be honorable and treat people the way I want to in this moment? Sometimes, you know, I remember during that film, the director's like, I want a tracking shot by this whole set of people who'd like walk through the desert, they'd lost their homes and whatever. And I did it, and afterwards I was like, don't ever make me do a shot like that again. I was repeating this completely objectifying image of poor African people trapped in the middle of the desert, tracking by them, all completely anonymous. That's a, like, that's a racist and dangerous image in the world. And it's harmful in the doing of it. I'm just walking by you like I don't care about you. I'm just using you for this thing I'm going to take away. And sometimes you realize you're doing that in the middle of doing it because you see people's faces. So I'll give you an example. Um, we were in Rwanda after the genocide, and we were making a film about how women were doing work that men used to do because so many men had been killed. And we were driving from one place to the other place, and the light was beautiful. It was sunset, and we saw all these women working in a sugarcane field. And I was like, ah, oh, stop the car, right? And I could have gotten it from the side of the road, but they were really small in the field, and I knew the light was about to end. So we went into the place, and the director got out of the car and ran and talked to the owner, and he was like, no problem. And I ran out into the field, and I put my camera down, and the light was going, the light was going, so I started filming. And all these women just were like, started sucking their teeth at me and turning their backs. Because here they were, they'd been working for 10 hours, it was the end of the day, in a sugarcane field, working, it turns out they were working for a dollar a day. They were hot, they were tired, and here comes a big white lady with a camera who doesn't speak to them, who comes and puts her camera down and starts filming them. And they were all like, fuck you, right? But they had to keep working, so what do they do? They just all, and turned around. And I was like, oh my goodness, what have I done, right? But I was, I was doing it because I was like, I gotta get the shot. The light is fading. We're making a film about women. We're making a film for something that's gonna be good. But in their experience of me, I was making all kinds of assumptions about them, and they were like, fuck you. And I respect that, <laughs> right? I stopped filming the shot, and I was like, I went over, and I spoke to them, and I said, I am so sorry. Here's who we are. This is what we're doing, da, da, da. And the light was gone. I did not get the shot, right? So that's one level of it. Let me give you a more comp. So that's like, and for me, I was angry with myself. I had been filming for too many years to do something stupid like that. Because those are my ethics, right? 
it's not worth it to me, that beautiful shot of that, if they are going to feel objectified, used, like one more foreign person coming and making an image of them. And I think about that because of the history of images in the world. Some people who don't have power have had images made of them that do harm to them, and they have no control over it. So we are a part of that. We are a part of the construction of images that are often really racist images, right? We, have, we are part of the construction of images that are often really discriminating or sexist images because that's been a part of the power structures that exist. And when we try to replicate certain images, we're just still doing it, right? So here's the other story. So we're, yeah. No, no, go. No, no, interrupt. So uh, if you were to revisit that situation again, right. how would you do it differently? Like, would you give up on the shot or would you? Right. Right. So, so, so I mean, here would be a solution. Uh, the light's going to go. It could be a wide shot of people in the field, and you see the light, and they don't see you filming them, right? And that happens sometimes. Sometimes you are get, it's the only chance you can get to get a shot. And, and they might see you from across the way filming them, but it's not you coming into their world and like taking it without speaking to them. It's still in a strange territory, right? You're filming people without them knowing it, which is what happens with long lenses, right? We can get all kinds of images without people knowing it. And I think it's in the image. The distance is in the image. Uh, I think in that case, I probably would have said, beautiful light, we don't have time to get that shot. Maybe. But I'm a sucker for beautiful light, right? Like, you live for beautiful light. So how do you live for beautiful light is you know it's coming. Every day, there's going to be beautiful light at the end of the day. And there's a time called magic hour, right? You are ready for it. You think about, where do I want to be at magic hour? And you get there, and you get your camera ready, and you're there before magic hour happens. Because it comes every day. <laughs> And it's beautiful, and you should be filming during magic hour, right? So it's like thinking about the light as a, one of your collaborators. And that different temperatures of light in different moments of the day have different emotional meaning. And like, if you're making some film about the way, like, the contrast of things and life is hard, like, you want to film at noon every day. There's some films I've done where I only film at dawn and only at magic hour. But we've all seen movies like that where you don't believe in reality because it's not always beautiful like that, right? So it depends, but, but like knowing that the light is coming and using it as one of your, it's part of your set of tools. And I'm not saying like, you know, you can always like be in a moment and something really like, unexpected will happen and you'll shoot it and then you'll have made some terrible mistake and it'll be over. Uh, but you can prepare for the fact that a day, that the sun comes up and the sun goes down. Like you do know that as, as a filmmaker, right? Yeah. Can I ask you a question about, I want to say that I appreciate about the way you took that shot, mm. this idea of making space. Mm. Yeah. 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 Here. And that's an example to me of someone who doesn't have permission. And I feel like when you answered some questions about that, you talked about making mistakes. But I guess I wonder, like, if you wanted, I, I assume you you had other reasons for including this footage, and I wasn't, I didn't have a problem with all of the footage. Right. But. but so I guess my question, like, one of my questions was, you wanted to ask all these things for permission, and mm. your producer said, yeah. You don't Right, right, right. So this is, uh, this is. Did you consider showing that shot of the women who are monitoring the back from you? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, and I actually, I actually went back to, the, I went and looked for this footage because it was such an impactful experience for me. And I was so, it was so funny, like, I turned off the camera so fast because they, like, you know, I, I was like, ah! Oh. And so that, that footage didn't exist, right? But you are so right. I mean, I have been troubled by what we did in that hospital in Nigeria since it happened, right? And I don't, um, I, I, I think it is terribly morally wrong that a healthy baby is dying because of the fact of the unfairness of the world. We went to that hospital because the hospital agreed they are one of the hospitals with the worst maternal mortality in the world. They're trying to change that. They want people to know how hard it is. So we went with a shared purpose between the hospital and the filmmakers. Now, I'm the one choosing to work on a film about maternal mortality. That means I may film a mother dying, right? Like that's in the choice to work on a film like that. So I'm torn already between the idea of I really care that too many women are dying in childbirth in the world. I believe maybe if a film gets made about it, that might change. It might change people's awareness, right? And there was a big period of time in the history of documentary filmmaking sort of that emerged called impact filmmaking, where people believed, I can see a problem. I can make a film going to solve the problem. Turns out it doesn't quite work like that. But and I've worked on films where like you film something and something really dramatic happens and some change happens and right? So what do we do in the world? And these are all these questions we have. So I went into that situation knowing like oof. And when we walked into the Maternity ward, there was a uh, like a grid, and you see it in the original film, where they say how many mothers died that week and how many babies died that week, and you're like, oh, that's a lot, right? And we're going to be here for three weeks, right? And so, um, you know, you have these incredible moments where they have a they have this amazing um, thing called an anti-shock garment which is basically like a body tourniquet. It's like a wetsuit that they put on mothers who are bleeding out and they you know, sort of put them on. So we are filming with this wonderful nurse and she's like, quick, 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 come with us, quick, quick, quick. And they're pulling this woman out of a taxi cab. I've ne she's gray. She's just gray. And I'm like, I'm filming a dead woman being pulled out of this car, right? And, and she's saying, no, 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 no. And we're running with this woman, completely limp, completely gray. And they go and they put this suit on her. And they start transfusing with her with blood. And little by little, I'm seeing the color come back to her face. And it's like I filmed Lazarus coming back from the dead, right? And, and you could have no greater visual story of how this anti-shock garment can bring a woman back to life. It's very cheap and inexpensive. It's really dramatic, amazing footage. And the company that makes the anti-shock garment has used it to raise money to get more of these anti-shock garments in places. right? So I can say, like, wow, I did good in the world. There are more anti-shock garments out in the world. But at the same moment that that husband was running in carrying his wife who's dying, there's a person running back filming, right? So both of those things are true. So I mean, this is just like, ugh, like ongoing dilemma all the time in that hospital, which is why, like in many ways, it's the core of the movie for me, right? Because I'm so ethically torn about what that means and what that is. Um, Yeah. 
Oh, oh, well, this is actually a similar story. So this is actually, a, this, one, this one I can break down. Okay, so still in Rwanda, we're filming, we're driving, and we hear screaming. And we sort of look out across the valley, and you can see a group of people and a stretcher, people carrying someone on a stretcher. So I turn to the director and I say, are we going to help them? Now, remember, we're here to make a movie. We have a short amount of time that we're in the place. A lot of money has been spent to bring us here. The filmmaker has to get stuff in a certain amount of time. The producer is putting pressure, right? We are not ambulance drivers. We are not med doctors. Uh, we are in a place where there is no like operative infrastructure, right? If we are stopping every minute to help people, we will never make a movie. But we hear a person screaming on a stretcher across the way, and it's a big valley, and there's only us, and we're the only car, and people are walking. So I say, are we going to help them? And the director says, we're going to film them, and then we're going to help them. So now I can make a decision as a human. I could say, like, no way. I'm not going to do that. Let's just help them. We don't have time to film them. I think, OK, in this like split second of a moment, I think, OK, like, OK, how can I do this? And I think, OK, I know what we're going to do. Because the camera's in the back of the car, packed, doesn't have a battery in it, doesn't have a card in it, because we're traveling from one place to another. I know how long it's going to take me to get the camera out and whatever. So what do I do? I say, OK, we're going to drive past them and drive up to the top of that hill. Because here's what happens. They say, OK, so the director trusts me. We drive past these people, get to the top of the hill. I get out. I get the camera out. I turn. I have this incredible wide shot where you see the long, 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 long road they've been walking on. You can hear the screaming coming from a distance, right? They're walking up towards the camera, so it becomes a close-up shot, right? And you see that it's a woman in labor on the stretcher, and they put the stretcher down. And we talk to them, we take the woman, we put her in the car, we drive to the hospital. OK, so I would say, and you would say by the look in your eyes, that's a really morally questionable thing to do, right? We're in Rwanda. The genocide happened, and the UN did nothing. We are driving in a white truck that looks like a UN truck. We're a bunch of white people. They, turns out they've been carrying her for seven hours. So we drove past them. So all of those people who have lived through the genocide and already lived through seeing people from the outside who are there in white vehicles drive past them as their families get killed, experience that again, right? That is actually what it felt like to be a white person in Rwanda post-genocide when the only cars for rent were white trucks. You're implicated in that. You actually are a part of that historical moment, whether you were in the UN or you were there or not, because you are the visual symbol of that, right? So, and how do you manage that? So, I would say the worst thing that we could have done, drive by them, get the shot, drive away. That would have been worse than what we did, right? Uh, what I experienced when I got out of the car was looking at the looks on their faces, which were just like, what are, not dissimilar from the women in the sugarcane field. What are you doing? Who are you? I hate you. What's going on? You know, like, I'm seeing all these things. And then I, 
like we, in the moments when we were loading the woman into the car, I was apologizing to everybody. And one guy said, oh, yeah, no, I'm a camera person. I know what you were doing. One guy said, like, oh, we were so happy. Like, once you stopped, it was, we were so relieved. The other guy was just like, I can't believe you did that to us. Right? I did not. I objectified them in the moment. And then I talked to them as humans. And I apologized to them. Does that undo the damage that they felt in the moment? No, not necessarily. And I, like, the, the alternative to stop and ask permission for them, riddle me that one. There's no way that you could stop and ask them for permission when they've got stretcher. They would have put the woman down and put her in the car. There's no, there's no way you could get that shot. So I was answering to the needs of the director who I was hired by, who I'm there for, right? Like, we're there to make a movie. So guess what? Was the shot in the movie? No. Right? So it's easy, I think, to be in the place where we say, like, I know morally what to do. And I will guarantee you, if you make documentary films, you will make decisions that are morally compromised. And you will not do that because you're a bad person. <laughs> You will do that because the world is a very complicated place. And to be making movies in this world is completely ethically complicated. If you feel so uncomfortable with being a white person or a Chinese person going to another country and making a film, then maybe make films at home. Maybe make films only with people who look like you. Maybe only make films with people who have money. Maybe. Right, you can make these decisions. This is where I'm saying, like, we control our choices in some ways, right? And I do think certain things are structural problems. It's a structural problem that white American people keep going to African countries and making films about poverty. You should have more African people in your crew. It's a structural problem that rich people always make films about poor people, right? You can, you can integrate crews in different ways. You can be training a person who's never had a chance to work with a camera to be your assistant, right? These are structural problems of inequality that you, you inhabit the space. You're a part of it. Does that mean that you do not engage at all? That is a choice that you're making, right? Uh, and, you know, I mean, Nancy and I have been We've been working in this world for 30 years, right? And there are lots of ways in which we have been both powerful and powerless within it. And it shifts all the time, <laughs> right? And you can think you've made a really great decision of like, oh, I'm only going to take my all Chinese crew into this all Chinese space. And then it turns out you can't make the movie because uh, like, for example, we went to Morocco and all the Moroccan journalists uh, who we worked with, like, it couldn't be known by the king that they were working on the project. So they were like, please follow this story. Don't, we're not going with you. Go as outsiders into this place. Tell this story we are not allowed to tell. Get it out into the world. Right? So there's all, it's moving in all kinds of directions. There's not a simple answer to this. But I think question, if you're working only with people who look like with you, if you're working with an all-male crew or an all-female crew, or you're working with all people from the same economic class or all the same political perspective, question all of those things and make choices about those things. Think about who you work. So, so I'll go back to, we're going to 1259. Yeah, we'll stop. Yeah, we'll stop now. I got more to talk about. We got more time.